One of the most common complaints that I get about the PID toolbox basement tuning method is the challenge of flying line of sight in a confined space. And up until now, I've always assumed that these tests had to be done using acro mode or rate mode. But in this video, I'm going to show you that you can actually use auto level mode or angle mode as it's called in Betaflight. And this should make the tests a whole lot easier for a lot of people, especially if you're doing these tests in a confined space. So the little rig we'll be looking at today is the Airblade Transformer 4-inch. This quadcopter falls under the category similar to the Flywoo Explorer and those type long-range rigs. Now the, the general goal for these is to get them under 250 grams, but as you can see here, this one is coming in at uh, quite a bit more than that. And, and it really depends on the way you build it. And But I wasn't too worried about that for my purpose here. Um, and I also have a naked GoPro on this. So well, what's really remarkable at, about this is, is that I, when I started tuning it in Betaflight 4.3, I was really, really surprised at the kind of performance that I could get with feed forward. So I think this is something that you'll find quite surprising, in fact. So in order to use auto level, of course, we're going to have to first make sure we have the accelerometer turned on in Betaflight. And then here in the Setup tab, what you're going to want to do is, is put the copter on a nice level surface and then simply click the Calibrate Accelerometer button. Okay, so then we're going to go over to the PID tuning tab, and here we're going to set things up for our series of basement tuning tests. So what we're going to do first is we're going to pull feed forward down to zero, dynamic damping down to zero, and we're going to put the drift wobble slider at about 0.3. It's good to have just a little bit of eye term to help out with these tests. Um, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to set the angle strength. You see down here, we're going to turn the strength up to 100, and we're going to hit save. And so what we're going to do is we're going to be doing a series of tests, slowly manipulating the damping slider. Once we get the proper ratio there, we're going to do a series of tests where we manipulate the master multiplier. And then we're going to bring feed forward back in and we're going to look directly in the traces to assess the effectiveness of feed forward in reducing the set point to gyro lag. And then we're going to actually tune eye term after feed forward. And this is going to allow, allow us to really push eye term because what ends up happening is feed forward really closes the temporal lag between the set point and gyro. And as a result, eye term doesn't have a chance to really wind up. So you can really push this quite high. And you're going to see that in some of the results that I show in a moment. So then you can just leave your rates as you like them because this will have no impact on the actual response of the copter while in auto level mode. So the first thing I wanted to confirm is whether using angle mode causes any difference in results. So what you're looking at here is a step response for roll and pitch. It, the brown is doing the step test in acro mode and the red is doing the step test in angle mode. And you can see that for all intents and purposes, these curves are identical. So this is really cool. So this means that we don't, we no longer have to be doing these tests in acro mode. This should make it a lot easier for folks to just be able to do these tests in a real confined space um, and not risk, you know, uh, hitting a wall or doing any damage to your property. So, okay, so I have all of the results here now collected together. And so I'm gonna, I'm first I'm gonna look at the PD balance tests. So this is the results of our series of PD balance tests. So you can see here that P and I are held constant across all the tests and D is slowly increased as the slider goes from 0 0.6 to 0 0.8, 1.0, 1.2, 1.4. You can also see a nice decrease in the peaks over here, which is nicely represented over here in the subplots. So based on these results, it's clear that somewhere between 1.2 to 1.4 is optimal. Sometimes it's best to be a little conservative here so that you don't push D term too high and it allows you to be able to later push the gains a little higher without having any issues of, of D term oscillation or any kind of D term noise. So we're going to pick 1.2 for both of these. Next we're going to move on to the master multiplier gain tests. And you can see very nicely as we increase the gains you can see the lines shifting earlier and earlier very nicely, okay? And you can also see that very nicely displayed here in the sub-panel called latency for roll and pitch. Now usually what I do when I look across a series of gains like this, I look for any kind of oscillation and sometimes that'll actually show up in the step trace itself. It's also worth looking directly in the traces themselves. 
and sometimes you have to zoom in for that but um, there's no indication of any feedback oscillation on the gyro itself it's also worth looking in the spectral analyzer so what i'll do is i'll plot these up for both gyro and gyro pre-filtered so what you're looking at here is in the dotted is the pre-filtered gyro and the solid is the post-filtered gyro and you can see across most of the no most of the noise you can see that there's no real difference in the noise in the gyro noise as you increase pd gain there is something in the lower frequencies but in fact it turns out that this is not oscillation so let's pick the highest gain and if you plot gyro against set point you just, you'll see something interesting about this relationship so in this case the gyro is the solid curve and the set point is the dashed curve and let's look at those low frequencies again what you notice here is the set point has this interesting characteristic shape at 50 hertz and i've seen this many times before and this is essentially a kind of artifact that's coming as a result of using crossfire 50 hertz what's really interesting here is this effect is actually showing up in the gyro itself in other words what's happening is this if you zoom in on any one of these moves what you'll notice is that there's in fact a little bit of a ripple on the p term you see that here if we just use the milliseconds to hertz let's just put a point here and then measure the period of that and you can see that's about 58 hertz so what's happening is this if you look closely at set point you, you can still see remnants of the square wave input that characterizes the receiver signal and what's happening is that the rc smoothing is smoothing it out pretty good but it's not perfect and so those bumps are actually translating into slight bumps in the gyro itself but what that means then is that we don't really need to worry too much about what's going on here. This is not a characteristic oscillation from too high PID gains. It's not classic feedback oscillation. The, the other thing that I do is I look at the relationship between roll and pitch. I, and I use these to set the optimal pitch to roll ratio. And what you'll notice here, for example, is pick any, any gain, any single gain, you'll notice that roll, for example, here is, is showing 22 milliseconds, whereas pitch is showing about 29 milliseconds. So that's about a 30% slower response for pitch relative to roll. And so I ended up choosing number 7 for roll and boosting, them, and boosting pitch a little bit further. And that resulted in approximately the same latency between the axes. That was, so that was achieved by simply dialing the master multiplier back to about 1.8 and then just tipping up the pitch to roll axis 1.2. So in order to test feed forward, we're going to have to unfortunately use rate mode. So although, although feed forward is actually working in angle mode in Betaflight 4.3, it wasn't giving the same kind of output that we get or that we see when we're using uh, acro mode. So I did these tests in acro mode and I simply set feed forward to at either 0 0.5 or 1.0. And for these tests, we're basic, basically going to analyze the data straight from the traces themselves. So what I do then is simply zoom in on the trace and, and measure the latency that we're getting between the two traces. You can see here that the gyro is really following the set point quite nicely. It's, it's actually really remarkable how well this is tracking. The, the gyro is perfectly mirroring the set point with a constant delay. So by all accounts, the gyro is in fact, the copter is in fact doing exactly what the set point is commanding, right? It's just that it's doing it with a constant delay. And in fact, this relationship how parallel you see how parallel these lines are this relationship really reflects how nicely the p to d balance is tuned because what it tells you is that the gyro is matching the acceleration and the deceleration of the of the input the output is accelerating and decelerating at the exact same rate and this is actually a good metric to actually to 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 gauge where how much feed forward to use because if you use a lot of feed forward if you use too much feed forward what you'll start to find is that the output will actually start to sometimes accelerate faster than the input okay than the set point 
and you'll start to get and and this perfect parallel relationship will start to start to dissolve so even though you bring the lines closer together they'll actually start to wax and wane about one another um so what you're looking at here of course is the is the highest gain without any feed forward and we're going to measure the latency there And you can see it's about 16 milliseconds. And then we're going to compare that to feed forward at 0.5. So you can see that with feed forward at 0.5, we still have this nice parallel relationship, which is really good. But now, let's look at that latency. Zoomed right in here. So now you can see we're down to about 7 milliseconds. Okay, so that's remarkable, right? And you can see that in the way the traces are overlapping here. Just let me remind you again, this is the before, okay? And this is feed forward 0.5. So you can really see that. Now let's go to feed forward 1.0. Look at that. So this is this is really superb. This is really this is really amazing. So you can see that there's some you know, accelerating slightly faster here, but really, for all intents and purposes, the gyro is really tracking the set point beautifully here. So we're not really losing any of that 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 nice parallel relationship, not very much. And at the same time, we're getting this beautiful tracking. And you know what's really remarkable here is there's a common misconception that Betaflight feed forward makes your copter twitchy and causes the HD footage to not not look very smooth. What's really amazing about this is I've actually is I've actually smoothed the input quite a bit. If you look at the set point traces, these are quite smoothed. And that's because I've actually set the RC smoothing filter cutoff at 15 hertz. And so that's that resulted in quite a bit of RC delay. But what's really interesting is that I actually gained some of that back by using feed forward. So I gained about 15 milliseconds just using feed forward so even though i'm losing about 12 milliseconds or so with such a low cutoff of, of rc smoothing i'm essentially gaining it back by using the sufficient amount of feed forward so yeah this is this is just really remarkable um how this little rig can can track so well despite the fact that it's really doesn't have a huge amount of power it's quite light so that's probably one of the key factors but but really you know feed forward is really something it's quite it's quite amazing um so now that basically the set point the gyro lag is almost zero then there's lots of room for increasing i term so i actually settled on 1.2 but i could have gone higher on this if i wanted to um I think for this little rig, the advantages wouldn't matter that much. But if you were uh, using a racing rig, for example, more item can really help the cornering. Um, but it's quite remarkable. Once you really close that error gap with feed forward, you can really drive the item quite high and not really cause any issues. Yeah, so here's a final look at the overall settings for this rig. So once again, you know, basement tuning just got a whole lot easier. So don't forget now that you can do most of these tests using auto level mode. And uh, that's about it. Happy tuning.